Good morning, Year 5, and welcome back to Rooftoppers, our class text by Catherine Rundle. We're going to read chapters 5 and 6 today. By the time Sophie's 12th birthday came around, she had almost stopped breaking plates and the books had been moved from the kitchen back to Charles's study. Charles called her in there to give her his present. It stood on the desk, a square tower wrapped in newspaper. What is it? It looked like the size of a bathroom cabinet, but even for, from someone as unusual as Charles, that seemed an unlikely gift. Open it. Sophie tore off the paper. Oh! Her breath got tangled up somewhere on the way out. It was a stack of books, each bound in a different coloured leather. The leather glowed despite the grey day outside. There are twelve, one for each year. They're beautiful, but Charles, weren't they terribly expensive? They looked as though they would be warm to touch. Leather like that wasn't cheap. Charles shrugged. Twelve is the right age to start collecting beautiful things. Each of these, he said, was a favourite of mine. Thank you, thank you. It's the things you read at the age you are now which stick. Books crowbar the world open for you. They're perfect. Sophie turned them over. She sniffed the insides. The paper smelt of brambles and tin kettles. I'm glad you think so. Although, if you turn down the corners of the pages like that, I shall have to bludgeon you to death with Robinson Crusoe. When she had examined the last one, it was Grimm's Fairy Tales, and the illustrated plate in the front looked promising, Charles went to the window sill and came back with a carton of ice cream. It was the size of Sophie's head. Happy birthday, my child. Sophie dipped in a finger, which was not allowed, but could probably be got away with on her birthday. It was rich and sweet. Sophie dug out a chunk with Charles's ruler and grinned up at him. It's perfect, thank you, it tastes exactly like birthday should taste. Charles believed food was better eaten in beautiful places, in gardens or in the middle of lakes or on boats. I have a theory, he said, that the best place to eat ice cream is in the rain on the outside box of a four-horse carriage. Sophie squinted at him. It was sometimes difficult to tell if Charles was joking. Is it? You don't believe me, said Charles. No, I don't. Sophie struggled to keep a straight face. She could feel a laugh rising. It was like a sneeze. It filled her chest. Well, neither do I, to be honest, but it's possible, said Charles. You and I will go out and test it. Never ignore a possible. Fantastic. Four horse carriages were, Sophie thought, the best invention in the world. They made you feel like a warrior queen. Can we ask to have the horses gallop? We can though I suggest that you change into your trousers first. Those skirts are fascinating creations. It's as though you've mugged a librarian, said Charles. Yes, I'll be quick. Sophie gathered up her books in her, into her arms. She could only just see over them. And then? And then we will locate a cab. Very luckily, it happens to be raining. Charles, it turned out, was right. The rain lashed against them as they thundered round corners and made her ice cream run down over her wrist. It whipped her hair into wet snakes behind her. It made eating a challenge, but Sophie liked a challenge. When they returned, streaming with water and stuffed with ice cream, there was a letter on the doormat. One look at the envelope made Sophie certain it was not a birthday card. All the happiness went out of her in a whoosh. Charles read it with a tight set face. What is it? Sophie tried to read over his shoulder, but he was too tall. Who is it from? What do they want? I'm not quite sure. His face was transformed. He was unrecognisable as the man he had been only a minute before. It seems there is to be an inspection. Of what? Of me? Of us. It's from the National Child Care Agency. They say they have doubts about my ability to care for you now that you are a young woman. They think I will be unable to teach you how to behave like a lady. What? But that's crazy. Governments often are. I'm only just 12. I'm practically still 11. Nonetheless, they intend to come. Who is they? Who sent it? Two men. One is called Martin Elliot. The other name I can't read. But why? Why should two strangers get to decide about me? They don't know me. They're just men. Men. I know these sorts of people. They're not men. Their moustaches with idiots attached. Sophie snorted with snotty laughter. She wiped her eyes. So what do we do? I suppose we should clean. 
Together, she and Charles looked around the hall. It was clean enough already, she thought, if you didn't count the poems she had copied onto the wallpaper or the spider webs. Sophie liked spiders and always dusted around them. Do I have to move the spiders? I fear so, said Charles, and I will have to cut the ivy. Last year, an ivy vine had worked its way in through the window and spread over one wall in the hall. It had settled like a Sunday hat over the portrait of Charles's grandmother. Sophie loved it. Could you leave the part growing on Grandmother Pauline? That wouldn't notice, they wouldn't notice, would they? I can try, certainly, but Charles was clearly not thinking of grandmothers. And then there's you, Sophie. What about me? Sophie felt herself flushing. Is there something wrong with me? To me, of course, you are as close to perfect as, as a human can be. But I have a suspicion, though please do correct me if I'm wrong, that your hair will not meet with approval. No, not the front here, at the back. Sophie groped around the back of her head. What's wrong with it? Nothing is wrong with it exactly. It's just that it resembles a ball of string. I believe hair is more usually described as a curtain or a wave. Oh, it was true, she supposed. She had never read about a heroine with balls of hair. Leave it to me. That night, Sophie went to battle with her hair. At first, her hair seemed to be winning. The knot was at the base of her neck, the most awkward place to reach. This was usually the way with knots. Grimly, Sophie tugged until she had a handful of hair in her lap, but still the knot was enormous. She pulled vengefully and the comb snapped in two and stayed there, hanging in her hair. She swore under her breath. Sophie ran down to the kitchen and found the scissors. She wove them into the middle of the knot and bit down on her tongue for courage and cut. It was surprisingly satisfying. When she had cut out the comb and most of the knot, she plaited her hair into a thick rope over her shoulder. Unless you looked closely, she thought, you would barely notice. She felt gingerly at her scalp. Being ladylike was a painful enterprise. On the day of the inspection, Sophie scrubbed at her hands until her fingernails shone and she had rubbed half the skin off her knuckles. Charles polished her shoes with candle wax and a lump of coal and, as they had no iron, pressed her clothes with a hot brick. Charles mopped the floor and Sophie soaped the walls until she had taken half the pattern off the wallpaper. She placed jars full of flowers all over the house. Everything smelt of rose petals and soap. I think it looks fine, she said. Sophie had always loved the house and it seemed especially handsome today. I think it looks perfect. Then they hovered by the door, unable to sit still. At the last minute, a thought occurred to Sophie. How long do I have until they come, she asked Charles. Three minutes or thereabouts, why? I'll be right back. She took the stairs four at a time. In her bedroom, she powdered her nose with talcum powder and rubbed red paint on her cheeks and lips. There was no mirror. She hoped it looked right. Charles blinked when she came down. Sophie's suspicions that her cheeks were more clown than gra gracious young lady deepened, but before either had time to say anything, the doorbell rang. The woman on the doorstep had a clipboard and an expression like a damp sock. The man next to her had a briefcase and elaborate facial hair. Sophie thought he looked faintly familiar. Charles whispered, moustache, and Sophie fought not to laugh. They led the pair into the sitting room. The couple refused all offers of tea and began their questioning at once. Sophie winced away from them. It was like being under fire. Why isn't the child at school? said the woman. Sophie waited to see if Charles would answer. When he didn't, she said, I don't go to school. Why not? said the man. I learned from Charles. Do you have proper lessons? the woman looked sceptical. Yes, said Sophie. Of course I do. A useful sentence popped into her head. Charles says, without knowledge, you see only half the world. Hmm. And these lessons take place every day? Yes, lied Sophie. In fact, they did lessons whenever either of them remembered. Sophie found it very easy to forget. Can you read? said the woman. Yes, of course. That was stupid. Sophie couldn't remember not being able to read any more than she could remember not being able to walk. Can you do mathematics? Mm, yes, said Sophie. That was true, sort of. Although I hate the seven times table. I like the eights and nines, though. Can you recite your catechism? No. Sophie's insides grew colder. I don't know what that is. Is he a poet? I can do most of Shakespeare if you'd like. No, thank you. That will not be necessary. Can you cook? Sophie nodded. Plain cooking, pastry, a fine trifle for dinner parties? Mm, yes, I think so. 
It wasn't a lie, she told herself firmly. She'd never made a trifle, but anyone who could read could cook, as long as she had the right books. You can't be eating well. You slouch and you're too pale. Why is she so pale? For the first time, Charles spoke. She is not too pale. She is cut from the stuff of the moon. The woman snorted. The man was distracted, looking around the room. Is this where you do lessons? He asked Sophie. We mostly do them, she had been going to say, on the roof. But Charles widened his eyes in warning and his head gave the subtlest of shakes. Yes, she said, mostly in here. Then where do you keep your blackboard? Sophie couldn't think of a convincing answer to that one. She told the truth. We don't have a blackboard. And how do you expect to learn anything without a blackboard? Asked the woman. Well, I have books and paper. And, Sophie said brightening, I'm also allowed to write on the walls and draw as long as I don't do it in the parlour or the hall, unless I do it behind the coat stand. For some reason, the woman was not appeased by this. She stood and turned to the man. Shall we begin? I dread to think what we'll find. The pair marched through the house as though they were planning to buy it. They inspected the sheets for holes and the curtains for dust and looked in the larder. They took notes on, of the rows of cheeses and jars of jam. Finally, they marched up to Sophie's attic room and looked through her chest of drawers. The woman drew out the red trousers and the man shook his head sadly. The green pair, which had accrued some interesting stains around the ankle, made the woman shudder. Unacceptable, she said. I find it shocking, Mr Maxim, that you let this go on. Sophie said, but he doesn't let it go on at all. I mean, they're mine. They're nothing to do with Charles. Please hold your tongue, child. Sophie longed to hit her. Charles moved to stand closer to Sophie, but he said nothing. He had barely spoken, and he kept silence all the way downstairs, and only as he shook their hands did he speak a few words to the inspectors. Sophie strained but could not hear. She closed the door behind them and sank down on the mat. What did they say? Did I do all right? She chewed on the end of her plait. I hated them, didn't you? I wanted to spit. That man, he had a face like a baboon. He did seem excellent proof of the theory of evolution, didn't he? And the woman, I've met wrought iron railings with more human generosity. What were they saying when they left? They said they're going to submit a report. That wasn't all though, was it? You were talking for longer than that. I think we'd better have a talk. Where is the best place for talking? The kitchen? Sophie didn't want to be anywhere the inspectors had passed through. The house felt damp and clammy in their wake. No, the roof. Of course. I'll fetch some whiskey. Why don't you run down to the kitchen and fetch the cream jug? It helps to have cream, I think, on days like these. Sophie ran. The cream jug was cooling in the icebox. There was jam and a loaf fresh from the oven. She added that. She found Charles perched on the chimney pot. Sit down, have a little whiskey. He looked about the rooftop for a glass, then handed her the bottle. Take a gulp. The whiskey made Sophie cough and spit, but she said, Think of it as medicine. Yes, well done. Are you all right? Yes, of course. What's going on? What did they say? Sophie, you must try to believe what I'm going to tell you. You must try to understand. Can you do that for me? Of course I can, said Sophie. She stared at him indignantly. Why wouldn't I? Don't be too sure, my love. Believing things is a talent. Fine, I'll believe you. What is it? Have some bread and jam. You can dip it in the cream jug. What is it, Charles? Charles took some bread and rolled it between his finger and thumb. First of all, it will break my heart if they take you away. You have been my great green adventure of my life. Without you, my days would be unlit. He glanced down at her. Do you understand that, Sophie? Do you believe me? Sophie nodded. She flushed in the way she always did when people said nice things about her. Yes, I think I do. But there is nothing I can do to stop these people. You are not legally mine. Legally, you are the property of the state. Do you understand that? No, I don't. That's stupid. I could not agree more. It is nonetheless the case, my child. How can I belong to the state? The state isn't a person. The state can't love anyone. I know, but I believe they intend to take you. The pair didn't say anything definite, but they hinted. Sophie's whole body suddenly felt cold. They can't. They can, my darling. Governments can do both great and stupid things. What if we ran away to another country? We could go to America. They'd stop us, Sophie. They would tell the police I was kidnapping you. 
How do you know? I bet they wouldn't. Sophie jumped to her feet and tugged at his hand, his sleeve, his hair. Let's leave. We can just go, Charles. We don't need to tell anyone. Before they send in their report, please. He hadn't, he hadn't moved. She took hold of his sleeve. Please. I'm so sorry, dear heart. He looked twice as old as he had looked this morning and she almost heard his neck bone creak as he shook his head. They would come and fetch you back, my darling. There are people in this world who come out in a rash at the sight of a broken rule. Miss Elliot is one such person. Martin Elliot is another. Sophie jumped up. Elliot, I knew he looked familiar. Charles, do you think they're related? Good Lord, yes, in fact, quite possibly. My God, she said once her brother worked in the government. The witch! Somehow the idea of Miss Elliot helped. Anger was easier than misery. I won't give up, you know. It made her feel tougher and meatier just to say it. I won't go. It was one thing to vow to be tough. When the letter came, toughness felt very difficult. It arrived on a grey Monday morning. It was addressed to Charles, but she would have opened it anyway, had he not taken it gently from her. She watched his face, but it was wary and tight, impossible to guess. Can I see? Let me see, she asked before he could possibly be finished. What does it say? Is it good? Can I stay? You have to say I can. Let me see. Charles said, it's, it's not. For once he seemed to be without words. He handed it to her. Sophie held it up to the light. Dear Mr Maxim, we, the undersigned, write to inform you of changes in our policy on the guardianship of female persons aged between 12 and 18 years. Sophie scowled. Why do they have to talk like that? She hated official letters. They made her feel nervous. The people who wrote them sounded like they had filing cabinets where their hearts should be. Read on, Sophie. Charles's voice was darker than usual. The committee has come to the unanimous conclusion that a young woman should not be raised by a single man unrelated to her, except in unusual circumstances. In the case of your ward, Sophia Maxim, it was felt certain elements of her, her upbringing have been absolutely unsuitable for a female child. What do they mean, certain elements? Sophie stabbed at the paper with her finger. I don't understand. I don't know. I can guess. They mean my trousers, don't they? She said. That's mad. They're evil. Keep reading, said Charles. We must therefore inform you that your ward will be removed from your charge and enrolled in St Catherine's Orphanage in North Leicestershire. Non-compliance will result in a court order and a maximum of 15 years penal servitude. The committee's decision is final and effective immediately. Penal servitude? What does that mean? Jail, said Charles. The child care officer of your borough, Miss Susan Elliott, will collect your ward on Wednesday the 5th of June. Yours sincerely, Martin Elliott. Sophie felt suddenly hollow. She fished about for something to say. They spelt my name wrong. They did. If they have to break my heart, they could at least have spelt my name right. She looked at Charles. He did not seem to be reacting. Charles! A tear was making its way down her face. She licked it angrily away. She said, please, please say something. So you understood the letter. They're taking me away from you. They're taking you away from me. They intend to try, certainly. She didn't want to touch the letter. She dropped it and stood on it. Then she picked it up and read it again. She couldn't bear that absolutely unsuitable. Do you think if I'd worn skirts and if I didn't slouch or if I was prettier or I don't know, sweeter, would they have let me stay? Charles shook his head. She was astonished to see that he was silently weeping. What now? She slipped her hand into his pocket and drew out his handkerchief and placed it in his hand. Here, Charles, please say something. What do we do now? I'm so sorry, my child. She had never seen a man look so white. I fear there is nothing. Quite suddenly, Sophie couldn't bear it. She pelted up to her bedroom, tripping over the stairs. The tears in her eyes were making the world blur. Before she had time to think, Sophie grabbed hold of the poker and swung it at the cello case. It split with a crack. She swung again at the pitcher of water beside her bed, which shattered over her blanket and pillow. Sophie heard an exclamation below and footsteps running up the stairs. She stamped and kicked. The case splintered and shards of painted wood flew across the room. If you nev have never broken up a wooden box with a poker, it is worth trying. Slowly, Sophie felt her breath become more manageable. 
I won't go, she whispered with each swing. I won't. After a while, although the tears and snot still ran down her face, they didn't choke her. She found a rhythm. Smash, breathe. Crash, breathe. I won't go, she whispered. No, smash. No, crash. No. It took her some minutes to realise that Charles was standing in the doorway. Still alive, dear heart? Oh, I was just... Quite. Very sensible. He surveyed the room, then led her by the hand to the bathroom. This calls for hot water. He would say nothing else, and Sophie could think of nothing to do but to sit curled on a pile of towels, hiccuping and sniffing, while he put every pot they owned on the stove downstairs to boil and added dried lemon peel and mint to the tub until it steamed. Stay in for half an hour. I have some things to attend to. Sophie couldn't bear to sit still in the tub. Instead, she stamped to the window and back again and thumped the wall until Charles's voice floated up the stairs. Get in the tub, Sophie, and do some splashing. You'll be surprised at what a difference splashing can make. Sophie had forgotten that the bathroom floorboards were directly above the kitchen. She sighed and undressed, tugging vindictively at her boots. All right, she called. I'm in now. Having said it, she had to get in or it would be a lie. The hot water came up to her belly button and the lemon peel lapped against her legs. Once her body was covered in hot water, all the fight seemed to go out of her. Sophie sagged and lay in the tub. Her heart sagged too. She could think of nothing. When at last she clambered out, she made it only as far as her bedroom rug before her legs collapsed and she dropped down, still wrapped in her towel. She lay there half awake and went on with her staring at nothing. Gradually, the nothing changed into a something. A small dot of light was playing against the wall and she had been staring at it unseeingly for many minutes. She turned back to the pile of splintered wood that had once been her cello case to see what was casting the reflection. Then all the blood returned to her and Sophie leapt up. Still half glued to the green baize lining was a long shard of painted wood. Sophie seized it, catching a splinter in her thumb. Ah, damn! Under the green baize, there was a brass plaque nailed to the wood. The light had been glancing off it and reflecting a pinprick of sun on the far side of the room. On the plaque was an address. It was not in English. Sophie had to lay the scrap of wood on the table to read it. Her hands were shaking too much to hold it steadily. Fabricant d'instruments à corde. 16 Rue Charlemagne, Le Marais, Paris, 291054. Sophie found Charles in his study. He was sitting by the window with a newspaper in his hands, but his eyes did not seem to see it. Rain was blowing in and blurring the print on the front page, and he was doing nothing to shield himself. Sophie ran to him, but he did not turn around. He only blinked and his dark eyes were blank. Frightened, Sophie clambered onto the arm of his chair, tugged at his sleeve. She later thought she might even have chewed at his eyebrows in a bid to get attention. Look, Charles, look! Slowly his eyes woke up. He smiled just a little. What am I looking at? This! Charles looked back for his glasses, then when they did not appear, held it very close to his nose. Le Marais Paris. What is this, Sophie? It was French. The cello was French. Where did you find this? We have to go to France right now. She was choking and breathless. Today. Sit down, Sophie, and explain. Sophie sat on Charles's feet so he would not be able to move. Her mouth was dry and she had to chew on her tongue until she had enough saliva to talk. Then, as steadily as she could, Sophie explained. It took Charles less than a second to see her meaning. He leapt to his feet, spilling Sophie into a heap on the hearthrug. My God, sweet singing salamanders. Sophie, you brilliant creature. Why didn't it occur to me that she might be French? I feel I need some whiskey. Oh, good Lord. Sophie turned a backwards roll under the desk. What if she's living in Paris? What indeed? It's possible, Sophie. I don't say it's likely, my darling. You know that the cello case still may not be hers, but it's just possible. France, of course, my God. And never ignore a possible. Exactly. Oh, my darling creature, what a discovery. He looked at the letter, still lying on the desk. We need to get out of here at any rate. To Paris? Sophie crossed every finger and every toe she possessed. Of course, where else, Paris? Sophie, quick. To packing. Gather up your best pants and your whitest socks. It was like a bugle call. 
Sophie sprang up. Then she said, I don't think I've got any that are still white. Then we'll buy new ones when we get there. Paris pants. Yes, please. Sophie laughed, but the letter from Martin Elliot was lying on the table. It seemed to watch her. She said, will they come after us? Perhaps, yes, quite probably. That's why we'll leave tomorrow. What, really? Yes. But truly, I wouldn't joke about such things. Charles spread the newspaper open at the page with notices of trade, weather, ship departures. And if they do choose to follow us, or, which is more likely, alert the Paris police, it won't be for at least two or three days. Days? Sophie had hoped for weeks. Surely it would be weeks. Days. We need to be wary, Sophie, but we are at an advantage. He scratched an X next to a column of boat times and high tides and closed the paper. His eyes were glinting with such excitement that it was like warming herself at the fire. Organisations, Sophie, are much less clever than human beings, especially when that human being is you. Remember that.